Hello, welcome, welcome, welcome. We'll get started in a couple minutes. Let people sign in, get here. Find a place to chill if you can. Love it. People are signing in from Nashville and New Mexico and And I can finally uh, actually see the comments on Facebook and some of them on Instagram. The way that I'm uh, setting it up now is that uh, if you'd like to interact and have questions or um, comments, and, uh, it's better to do that. If you're tuning in on Instagram, it's better if you go... If you watch live on YouTube at the Against the Stream Meditation Center YouTube channel, um, then you can directly interact with me from YouTube. So that's the best uh, best way to do it. Um, I'm not able to see the comments and questions as easily on Instagram as I am. Uh, on the YouTube channel. I can also see it on Facebook, but my IT person said send people to YouTube rather than Facebook, so welcome. All right, we got YouTube representing from Austin, Texas. So one of the one of the cool things about um, going online, as most of you know, I've been live streaming this Monday night class for a very long time, anyways. But now that we're all stuck at home, we're um, starting to have this as our only only option, and people from all over are joining. Uh, just a moment, I forgot the microphone. Let me grab it. Okay, that should be better. Won't uh, change anything for you if you're watching on Instagram, but it'll change if you're, should change the sound quality if you're tuning in um, from YouTube. YouTube is live streaming as well as um, Facebook and Instagram. So welcome everybody. I've been going through the um, against the stream book on on Mondays um, and we're in this section about uh, as most of you know if you've spent any time looking at the book it's a uh, it's my take on the Buddhist basics of the Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path, the uh, Brahma Viharas, Loving Kindness, Compassion, the importance of forgiveness and equanimity and appreciation. And then these sections um, that we're at towards the second half of the book about um, the field guide and this, this section that we're in now about um, engaging reality and the reality for us as um, householder Buddhists, people who are engaged in practicing Buddhism, interested in coming to the Dharma. Um, but we're not going to have the level of renunciation, of course, as uh, monks and nuns do. So um, how do we relate to last week I talked about sexuality? and What's a healthy relationship to sexuality? What's 
um, sexual misconduct and what's um, healthy and, and allowable and um, the importance of community and this revolutionary lifestyle that we're trying to live and really what the Buddha offers us is a, a way to live, a, a way to train our mind through meditation and then a, a way to behave, a way to live in the world. And, um, you know, it's 2,600 years old, so uh, these are universal principles that, for the most part, continue to apply to us in our, in our life and um, apply to what we're happening right now with the uh, sheltering in place and the staying home and um, uh, the world clampdown that we're living through right now. Um, and tonight's topic is... Uh, comes in the section of engaging reality um, of our relationship to money and how do we how do we relate to money of course um, the Buddha and his followers the monastic side of the tradition um, are renunciates that that um, that renounces money and he the Buddha did give many teachings to householders um, lots of um, advice of how to, if you were going to choose to live in the world and work and earn a living and have businesses or work for businesses or have life, you know, careers, uh, how to do that. Um, of course, there's a factor of the eightfold path dedicated to livelihood, and uh, it's one of the, I, I really appreciate that uh, the Buddha was um, wise and, and compassionate and that actually put in the formulation of this path to liberation work and uh, our relationship to money and our relationship to, of course, it comes back to karma and um, ethics and um, how we earn money, how we spend money, how we relate to money. Uh, is important if we uh, have an intention of freeing ourselves from suffering. And then we have to look at all of the areas where we have the potential to suffer or cause suffering. And um, finances is a big one for a lot of people. So we'll get into that tonight. Um, I'll start with this quote. A rich man once asked the Buddha, I see that you are the awakened one, and I would like to open my mind to you and to ask your advice. My life is full of work, and having made a great deal of money, I'm surrounded by cares. I employ many people who depend on me to be successful. However, I enjoy my work and like working hard, but having heard your followers talk of the happiness of the renunciate's life and seeing you as one who has given up a kingdom in order to become a homeless wanderer to find the truth, I wonder if I should do the same. It continues, but just pausing for reflection. Do you ever have the thought, maybe I should give up all of the material ambitions and become a renunciate, become a monk or a nun. I know that certainly for the first years of my practice, it was a um, ongoing consideration. Should, should I ordain? Would that be a useful uh, path to, to consider and to engage? So this wealthy man's asking the Buddha, should I? He says, I'm wondering if I should do the same. He says, I long to be a blessing to my people. Should I give up everything to find the truth? The Buddha replied, the happiness of a truth-seeking life is attainable for anyone who follows the path of unselfishness or generosity. If you cling to your wealth, it is better to throw it away than to let it poison your heart. 
But if you don't cling to it, but use it wisely, then you will be a blessing to people. It's not wealth and power that enslave people, but the clinging to wealth and power. My teaching does not require anyone to become homeless or resign the world unless they want to. But it does require everyone to free themselves from the illusion that they are a permanent self and to act with integrity while giving up craving and clinging to pleasure. And whatever people do, whether in the world or as a recluse, renunciate, let them put their whole heart into it. Let them be committed and energetic. And if they have to struggle, let them do it without envy or hatred. Let them live not a life of self, but a life of truth. And in that way, happiness will enter their hearts. So we'll have some um, teachings and discussion about money, our relationship to money, and I think you know, uh, although it feels a little, I gotta admit that it feels a little. Um, I certainly don't want to be preachy um, uh, in this time where there people are are very. Um, justified in fears about the future and finances and um, businesses closing and um, and um, being out of work so many people are are suffering about um, the instability in the uh, economy that's being created by everything being closed for now or most everything being closed so well, let's discuss it but first let's meditate and um, find a way to to be that's relaxed and upright and we'll practice mindfulness Thank you for joining and we'll spend about 30 minutes in uh, meditation practice and then we'll have some Dharma talk and discussion uh, with the topic of money and our relationship to money. So find a way to sit that's upright and relaxed and as you're ready, allow your eyes to be closed. Relax any unnecessary tension that you can release. The brow, the eyes, the jaw, the shoulders, neck, chest. Breathing in, feel the sensations that the breath creates, the nostrils. Breathing out, try to soften your belly, let go of, let go a little bit more, soften a little bit deeper into the body's natural relaxed posture of sitting, soft belly, open heart. And establish an 
intention to be kind and patient, friendly and forgiving towards your own mind, no matter how many thoughts it has, how many times it wanders off into the future or past. Establishing an attitude of loving kindness towards yourself. May I be at ease with myself just as I am. And bring attention into the present time experience of the breath coming and going. Let everything else be in the background. The thoughts continue to arise and pass. Sounds come and go. Images appear and change even behind the closed eyelids. All of the sensations in the body of contact with the chair, the cushion, couch, bed, wherever you are. For the first few minutes, we establish mindfulness of the breath, choosing to focus our attention on the sensations created by the breath, following the Buddha's simple instruction of mindfulness where he said, breathing in, know that you're breathing in, breathing out. Know that you're breathing out. Let the breath become your focus. Feeling the breath, perhaps noting in and out as the breath comes and goes. Just to keep our attention there. And when the attention wanders, we're no longer present with the breath. We've become engaged in thinking about something else. Acknowledge that, perhaps even naming, thinking, 
fantasizing, remembering whatever's happening in your mind. You're not trying to stop the mind. But we are choosing to redirect our attention away from the thoughts back to the body breathing. With a quality of interest and investigation. And the attitude of kindness, friendliness. Returning, connecting, sustaining, letting go of the past and future, returning to the present. Here is where our clinging arises, our aversion. Here is where the causes of suffering are, and here is where we can begin to let go, develop compassion. We can only end suffering in the present. So we come back over and over to the body breathing, the emotions arising and passing, thoughts appearing and disappearing.
when we're new to the practice, it's uh, important to keep using uh, something like the breath as an anchor to return to. And the Buddha's instructions become more and more inclusive of our whole experience. The whole body, present time, non-judgmental kind awareness towards all of the sensations that we experience physically, from head to toe. All of the sense doors, part of our experience, the sounds include hearing both internal and external, smell and taste and sight even with the eyes closed, images, And we include the mind itself rather than trying to ignore the mind <clears throat> forever. It just becomes another part of this human experience we become mindful of thoughts, awareness, that our plans and memories, our emotions, our mental phenomena with a physical correlation, what the mind thinks affects the body, emotions arise, anger felt in the body, fear, tightens the jaw, the belly, remembering to soften and make room for whatever the mind is doing whatever the heart, mind is experiencing. They're just thoughts arising and passing. So we become more inclusive of our whole being, present time, physical, emotional, mental experience. We're also open to not just what's happening, but how it feels, what's the feeling tone. This is the second foundation of mindfulness. Are the sensations of your breath perceived as pleasant? or unpleasant or neutral? How about how your hands are resting in your lap? Pleasant, unpleasant, neutral? Or where your feet are touching the floor? What's the feeling tone? And how do you perceive these sensations in the body? Some parts of the body neutral, some perhaps painful and pleasant, some pleasant. Where does your attention get drawn? And likewise, in the mind, in the heart, emotions, thoughts. 
Some thoughts are pleasant, some are unpleasant. Some emotions are pleasant or unpleasant. Identifying through mindfulness what's happening here and now and how it feels. the sounds, the sights. Constantly bombarded with the sense doors, phenomena that is instantly perceived as agreeable or disagreeable, pleasing or not pleasing, pleasant or unpleasant. The more mindfulness shows us this, the more we see this clearly, the more we have the opportunity to become more tolerant of the unpleasant, more merciful and compassionate towards all of the unpleasant experiences that we have moment to moment throughout our days. Mindfulness becomes a practice of compassion. Learning to care about pain rather than run from it, turning towards it. We may be experiencing some of the hindrances as we sit, craving for this to be more pleasant than it is arises, or anger, aversion, intolerance for the thoughts, the emotions, the sensations that are here, or perhaps we become Sleepy, slothful, start checking out, falling asleep. Or restless, irritable, worried. Or perhaps doubt arises in the mind, confused, Tendency towards doubting our ability, doubting our worthiness. All of these are normal, craving, aversion, restlessness, procrastination, doubt, just part of the human condition that we see more and more clearly and we learn to not, not take so personally just what the mind does, it's not your fault. Just 
what it's like to have a mind, human psyche, to have a body. Right now, it's like this. What are you experiencing? What are you paying attention to? How are you responding? Can you soften a bit more? Let go a little bit or a lot? And for the last couple of minutes, um, I invite you to reflect on your relationship to money. What does money mean to you? What kind of place does it hold in your life? What kind of power do you assign to it? Do you give to finances? Where did you learn your attitudes about money? How has practicing Buddhism changed your attitudes about money, if at all? And when you're ready, allowing your eyes to be open, if you have them closed, 
and taking a moment to adjust your posture, stretch. So um, I'll restart the Instagram because this cuts off. Um, and I'd like to invite you to, um, as I restart the Instagram live stream, to consider coming over to um, watching the rest of the live stream on the um, Against the Stream Meditation Center YouTube channel. Uh, it'd be nice. Um, that way we could interact some if you have any questions or comments or want to want to participate some. So I'm going to stop this. Come over to the YouTube channel if you can. Uh, if not, I'll restart it in just a moment. My sense is that um, there's some simple uh, concepts that of course make sense as most of the, all of the Buddha's teachings are pretty practical, pragmatic. Um, and as that reading that I started with before the meditation pointed to, the, the Buddha's core perspective um, is that it's not, of course, it's not about money. Money is just uh, sort of an energy and, and uh, how do we relate to that energy of money? Um, it's, a, it's a necessity on some level for all of us on one level or another. Um, there can be so much suffering. Of course, the Buddha addressed uh, that poverty is a real form of suffering. But that when we are not experiencing the suffering of actual poverty and we're in some level of um, you know, sub subsistence or... Um, able to feed ourselves and our families and that there's still um, a great potential to suffer about how much money we have, how much we're earning, how much we're spending, how we're spending it. And again, the, the Buddha has this very simple, he says, it, you know, it's not about money. Once you're, once you're not in poverty, it's not about money, you know, and, and so really I'm speaking to you know, working class, middle class, you know, or, or, or upper middle class wealth um, perspective. I'm not really speaking to the experience of poverty. It's not something that I have a lot of um, direct experience with. But of course, it's a reality in our world. And... Um, What we see, what we see in our mindfulness is that our suffering comes from our clinging. Whether we're clinging to sense pleasures or we're clinging to material things or we're clinging to money, or we're clinging to views and opinions and um, clinging to resentments that this is the second noble truth. The source of our suffering is always some form of clinging. So the Buddha's attitude is that, of course, money is not evil or anything like that. It's just something that people tend to cling to. And that 
clinging to it. I, I love that line in that sutta where he says, better to throw it away than to let it poison your heart. And we all have to acknowledge, oh, how has my relationship to money poisoned my heart at times? Where I've become so attached, so afraid, or so irresponsible, or whatever it was, that uh, I created suffering for myself, or maybe even other people. So simple advice. Don't cling. <laughs> um, there's this great place in the suttas that I was looking at where the Buddha says, you know, right livelihood, of course, the um, fifth, fifth factor of the Eightfold Path, where the Buddha says, you know, earn money in a way that doesn't hurt others, doesn't cause negative karma for yourself or, or hurt others, this sort of practical right livelihood. Um, and then there's a place in the suttas where he's giving advice to some householders and he says, um, you know, with your profits, with your wealth, with, your, with whatever money you have. And so I guess um, profits is whatever money is left over, if there's any left over, um, after you take care of your basic necessities, you pay your mortgage or rent, you um, have your foods, you have your, you know, necessary requisites. He says, whatever wealth you have after, if there's anything left over, um, he said, only spend 25% of your profit of your money on pleasure. But I like that, right? Because sometimes as Buddhists, we can get so critical of like, oh, I'm not supposed to have any, not supposed to be attached to pleasure. So then some people say, oh, I'm not even going to um, participate or we judge our indulgence in even healthy sense pleasures. But the Buddha in this teaching, he says, 25% of your money uh, could be spent on things that you enjoy. Material, sensual experiences that are appropriate that you enjoy. He says 50% of your money, your wealth, your profit, um, should be reinvested in your business, in your should be invested. And the last 25% should be saved for emergencies. So think of that. If, think of your relationship to what you do with your paycheck or your profit, your money that you have. Um, how much do you spend on pleasant experiences, um, material things? How much do you reinvest and how much do you save? I was just reflecting on how I, uh, in general, don't live by this kind of 25, 50, 25. And, um, and that actually, if I had saved 25% of the money that I had earned um, in my lifetime, the profit or whatever, uh, I would be in a much different place uh, right now when the meditation center is closed and um, and uh, you know my livelihood is uh, not happening and the expenses are still happening but the income isn't happening but what if we had actually saved 25% of our money what if we had only spent 25% on the things that we, and that we had actually put 50% back into, uh, we had invested it. So it is something to reflect on. Uh, and I just also find it very interesting that according to the suttas, the Buddha was quite uh, clear about like, here's what you should do. Even though he's a renunciate, 
He's like, here's what you should do with your money. And there's these all of these places where the Buddha is saying, you know, just be be careful. Just don't squander it, invest it, and um, and that there's nothing wrong with some uh, house, you know, as a uh, as a householder. Nothing wrong with enjoying pleasure. There's a, another teaching that I love where the Buddha says there are four kinds of happinesses. The uh, there's a, a type of happiness which is the happiness of sense pleasures. The happiness that you feel when you're doing something fun, you're eating something delicious, you're listening to music that you brings you pleasure. There's a level, and, and it's kind of, the way I hear it is, it's sort of the lowest level of happiness is the level of indulging in sense pleasure. Is that then also, there is the happiness that we householders experience of um, material things. Like, you know, when we get a new motorcycle or we, that it gives you happiness for a period of time. Um, but it doesn't give you lasting happiness. It doesn't give you inner happiness. It's just a material thing and you have fun on it. And he said, but there's sensual happiness. There's material happiness. He said, but the higher forms of happiness, and this um, first one, uh, it relates directly to our relationship to money. He said, the happiness that we can experience of debtlessness, when we are not indebted, when we don't owe any money to anybody, when you've paid off your school loans and you've paid off your car loans and you've paid off your credit cards and you've paid off your mortgage if you have all of those things that there's this happiness of like ooh, what a relief to not be in debt and that's real practical um if you've ever experienced being out of debt uh there's a level of oh that's what a relief to not be concerned with repaying loans now, I also like to think of that, certainly he's talking about financial freedom and that that can be one of the goals and that all of the middle path, all of the Dharma is like, yeah, money, no, no problem. How we earn money, be careful. Our relationship to money, be careful because it's so easy to get confused and, and to cling and to not have a balanced relationship. Over and over, um, the Buddha is saying, yeah, get yourself out of debt. But he's also saying, be generous. Do not cling to your wealth. Be a blessing. Be generous. Give your wealth to people who have less than you do. Make sure to share your, your resources, your time, your energy. Be of service. This is part of our, it's a necessary part of awakening. We can't just get so focused on making money and paying off our debts and becoming wealthy that we don't give, right? That's part of the, like, it'll poison our hearts if we're not generous. The fourth type of happiness, so uh, sense pleasures, material things, debtlessness, the highest form of happiness is the happiness of blamelessness to live our life in accordance with the five precepts, in accordance with uh, nonviolence and honesty and integrity and uh, to, to live our life in a way that we aren't intentionally causing harm, where we will be blameless in the eyes of the wise. Now, of course, the wise is... Uh, you know, somewhat subjective, who whose eyes we look at our actions through. But, you know, of course, the Buddha's teachings is about karma. Are we living in a way that's creating negative karma for ourselves? Or are we living in a way that 
is not, that is in integrity, but honest, kind, forgiving. Those are our intentions on the Buddhist path. I just saw a uh, message on Instagram from somebody who says, uh, is it possible to stay sober? Or it's like impossible to stay sober uh, during this time. Um, they said, I'm losing it. And I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. And I encourage people who see that if you can to reach out to each other to support each other and I'll try to reach out to you and feel free to reach out to me um, it is possible to stay sober it is possible to learn to be uncomfortable and to not obey our mind even when it's giving us terrible advice like to get loaded um, you know, Buddhism gives us a map of here's the path to freedom, here's the path to recovery, here's the path to happiness. And it's not an easy one, but it's possible. The answer is absolutely, it's possible to stay sober. And, uh... So a few more thoughts about money, and I'm curious to try to turn this on, on you, and this was helpful for me. Um, Years ago, uh, I think I read something, and it asked us to look at our relationship to money and where did we learn it? Like, what do you, you know, how attached, how loose, how much faith, how much fear, how much generosity do you practice in your life? How much self-centeredness do we practice in our lives? And... Um, and where did you learn that? And of course, especially it often comes back to how we were raised, who we were raised by, and what did we learn from our parents? And what did you, you know, so just reflect for a moment. When you think of your relationship to money and you think of your mother's relationship to money, what did your, what did you learn from mom? And sometimes what we learn from our parents isn't what they say, but we learn from watching them when we were children or how they treated us around money or how they, what did you learn from your mom about money? And then looking at your other parent, what did you learn from your father about money? What did his actions, his attitudes about money? And then we look at our own relationship to money. How much am I replaying mom or dad or is there a grandfather or an uncle or a aunt or a grandmother that was a big influence on you around and then we come to the dharma and we say okay hey i i want to be different uh you know my parents taught me to suffer about money i don't want to suffer what's the buddha teach me responsible wise livelihood based in generosity and uh, some frugality on some level, um, and I and and this sort of like invest, you know, <laughs> invest your money, make money, do good things with money. Now I'm certainly not talking about the stock market uh, when I'm talking about investing. I was talking to a friend from the sangha today. He was asking me if I've been able to play cards. Many of you know I like to play poker sometimes, and. And uh, she was saying, you know, with everything shut down, could you play poker like online or something? And I said, no, I don't, I don't like playing poker online. So I just let it go. And, and um, she said, I've been gambling. Uh, she's like, I gamble all the time. And, uh, and I was like, oh, you mean the stock market? <laughs> you know, like uh, this sort of American attitude of investing, which is the stock market, which is just playing craps for the most part, right? It's like, uh, maybe it's got better odds than Vegas, but it's so gambling. I had this one Buddhist teacher who told me that he thought that um, if I gambled, 
Um, if I played poker, that I, you know, that that's not something that a Dharma teacher should do. And I just held my tongue, but I so badly wanted to say, you know, look around the Dharma teachers. <laughs> this is up at Spirit Rock. Like, look around, like, how many of these people are invested in the stock market? <laughs> like, that is gambling. <laughs> that's as much gambling as sitting down to play poker, for sure, with less uh, influence over the outcome. Um, anyways, what's our relationship to money? And it really helped me to identify that I was raised by a father who, um, had this attitude of like, um, uh, everything will be okay. Money will just come this sort of abundance, but also we don't talk about it and that there's something not spiritual about caring about money or talking about money. And so there was this sort of like, it'll all be okay, but it's not something that we focus on. I'm not going to teach my children anything about finances because that's spiritual people don't talk about money. And um, so I've got that in me on some level. And then my mom, and I know my mom's probably watching tonight, and sorry, mom, um, <laughs> hope I don't offend you, but my mom, uh, from watching her relationship to money, I got this message that everything will be okay because someone will bail you out. And partially I got that because my mom would bail me out of jail, <laughs> of debt, of, and her mom bailed her out. And, you know, this this sort of like, you don't have to fully take responsibility because it'll be okay. Someone else will take care of it for you on some level or another. And I got that. And I, you know, I see that. I see this sort of in me. I'm just, I'm just curious. I really offer this for your reflection. What did you learn and how do you carry those messages and how do you see them clearly, mindfulness, see clearly, and how do we change our response? Oh, oh nobody's going to, I have to take care of my own finances. Uh, I need to be wise about how I earn money, how I spend money. I'm open to questions or comments. Much easier for me to do them on... Um, the YouTube channel and a bunch of people checked in over there. Thank you for joining us on YouTube. Okay. I have a question here that is, um, it says money is survival in our culture. What can we say to people now who are facing poverty? Um, I don't know. Like I, I did, uh, Tibby, I did earlier say like, I, I don't so I don't feel like I have a great answer for that, and that it is going to be a um, a reality, as it always is a reality um, for people, and uh, you know could be also very very possibly could be a reality for me. I've already uh, lost you know eighty percent of my income, and then the last twenty percent kind of what is is certainly in question and going away right now, and. Um, you know, there's part of me from my own experience, and I'm certainly not in poverty yet. But there's that, that teaching there where the Buddha says, whatever people do, whether in the world as a recluse, uh, let them put their whole heart into it. Let them be committed and energetic. And if they have to struggle, so, you know, if we have to struggle poverty, um, let them do it without envy or hatred. And that's such a high, you know, can we lose? Uh, there's the vicissitudes that the Buddha talks about where there's going to be gain and there's going to be loss. And, you know, uh, people who are, uh, you know, in poverty rise up to gain up to, to middle class and middle class people, you know, circumstances happen and we sink back into poverty and 
um, put their whole heart into it and let them be committed and energetic. And when we have to struggle, can we struggle without envy and hatred, living not a life of self, but a life of truth? And in that way, happiness will enter their hearts now. Um, again, I want to say, like, of course, there's a necessity to um, being able to buy food and, and pay rent and all of that stuff, for sure. And it's all subjective and it's all kind of relative. And, you know, so often I've, I've traveled in Asia quite a bit and I go to Thailand every year and, you know, I've spent a lot of time with people who have um, very little financial resources and, um, you know, who are what we would consider in poverty. And, you know, there's a difference between like the monks who take a vow of poverty, who choose to um, live that way, than people who aren't and are struggling to, to make a living. But I've met some incredibly happy, poor people. Um, and being poor um, is not, you know, the same as not having enough food to eat. Poor, but, you know, maybe living in a shack, but having enough food and so I don't, I don't feel like I have a good, good answer to that. Um, the next question was, I realize the answer to this may be the middle way, although sometimes my conundrum is when I look at achieving wealth through the Buddhist lens, it seems to lose ambition, which lose to, leads to laziness. So that's interesting, Wesley. I'm curious about that, and we have a relationship. We could talk more about that, um, of what it is about... Because all the Buddha is saying is like, just don't cause harm in your, you know, be honest, live in integrity and earn wealth in a way that doesn't hurt people or delude people or, um, or hurt yourself. Um, so I'm not sure why that is affecting your, um, um, and your ambition. I feel like sometimes people mistake Buddhism as thinking, because we're practicing so much non-attachment that we're not supposed to have ambition. And that's certainly not what the Buddha is saying. He's saying, you know, don't cling, but it's okay. Maybe it's the difference between wanting, like ambition is like a healthy desire and there's healthy material desires and there's also desire and ambition. Like the whole Four Noble Truths is about the ambition to end suffering. We want to attain the Third Noble Truth. We want, I have this drive this ambition to wake up to get free now also it's okay to have material ambitions like uh, i i have plenty of them I, i'd like to um you know i've had all of this ambition to open meditation centers and to create recovery programs and to be of service and also financially i very much um would like to be supported and you know have you know, that, that wealth to have 25% to have fun with and 50% to reinvest and 25% to save. Uh, that's very much been a, a goal of mine and I've felt very ambitious. Um, first about my own awakening, second about helping others, third about making money for it. So it's just sort of like prioritizing, like money's never been the priority, but it is an important consideration. It is back here of like, how can we help how can we serve? How can we do whatever we're doing? And then also, how can we be supported for it in a good way? Um, one more question here. To our knowledge, did the Buddha ever speak about a world that somehow survives, let alone thrives, without any form of commerce and or monetization? Some livable non-materialistic world it sounds from your talk that the answer to this is no but i was curious uh thanks for the question rick um i think that the answer is no but i'm not uh scholarly enough about all of the buddha's teachings to say for sure he never said that i mean what he does say is that um there are more realms of existence than just this human material realm. And that perhaps in other realms, you know, if you want to get 
esoteric about it. Um, and in the traditional teachings, there's the human realm where we are here now. And it's a realm of money and commerce and, you know, different levels of capitalism and communism and socialism and, you know, barter economies. But there's always, it's always economy. And then there's um, the animal realm. And animals don't um, deal with money. <laughs> but maybe there's like a power economy in animal kingdom. Certainly a food chain. Uh, but then, then there's these realms of um, jealous gods, and there's there's also heaven realms uh, in in Buddhist cosmology. And I don't know, but I don't I don't think that there's a, um, an economy, a, a kind of financial economy in those unseen realms. But I think your question was more about kind of um, civilizations, or uh, well, you said a world that somehow survived, alone thrived. Um, so I don't think so on on this histor historical, you know, human realm. Um, so there's this question about that. Um, in the 2550-25 scheme of things, where do um, bills and rent fit in? I think that he's talking about, you know, profit. After the bills are paid, after the rent is paid, you know, when you... Um, then what's left over is your, is your wealth. All, all your bills are paid. You've made your, you know, student loan payments and your mortgage payment and your credit card payment. And you have a thousand dollars left, put 500 bucks into an investment, spend 250, save 250. It was, that's the way I think about it, when your bills are paid and you've paid your taxes, all of that. Um, somebody's asking me, what mantras do I chant? Um, the form of Buddhism that we practice is not a mantra recitation Buddhist practice. Um, the closest that we come to chanting mantras is the, um, what are called the Brahma Viharas, the practices of loving kindness, compassion, uh, forgiveness, appreciation, uh, equanimity, where we recite, we do, we focus our mind on phrases, like three sentences. So loving kindness uh, mantra would be, um, may all beings be happy. May all beings be at ease. May all beings be free from suffering. And then we would say it again, may all beings be happy. May all beings be at ease. May all beings be free from suffering. So in that way, it works like a mantra does, where we're concentrating the mind on, on these phrases, but we don't um, assign like that they're sacred phrases. It's not like in Tibetan Buddhism where they do Om Mani Padmi Hum as a mantra. In the Theravadan, we don't really practice those kind of, of, of mantras, but we do have these phrases that we train the heart and the mind with. I think, um, let me wrap it up. If we're going to make this choice to live in the uh, material world, and by that I mean to not go off to the monastery and become a monk or a nun, we're going to engage in, um, in the world, then, of course, right livelihood becomes the uh, finding a job to earn money in a way that's not causing harm to ourselves or others. That's not negative karma, unwholesome. Um, very important. And um, then being careful with our, our, our wealth and, and saving and investing and, and just breaking. I mean, I just feel like we all have to break our our um, delusion that money equals happiness. Of, of, you know, of course it doesn't. Uh, it, it just, um, even some of the, there's been some studies, whatever studies are worth, that show that, you know, of course there's a suffering of poverty. And then there's, um, you know, for kind of working class, middle class, even upper middle, you know, there's this level of, in, in, in America, in, in our kind of culture, um, there's a level of 
uh, I, feel, I think I feel like the median income was like people reported, um, you know, at about seventy or eighty thousand dollars a year average income in this country, people reported this sort of level of satisfaction, and that when people got above that, like between, I think it was eighty and a hundred thousand dollars a year, and this is probably an older study, where they said at that point they, people reported a slight increase in happiness when they were making a little bit more money, slightly happier, but that then when it got into the six figures, into the hundreds of thousands or the millions of dollars, that there was almost no increase in people's happiness when they started making, you know, upper middle class, wealthy, more and more money. Um, and that, of course, many people say, when I became really wealthy, I became less happy, not more happy. Um, I invite you uh, and encourage you to think about your relationship to money as a very important part of your um, spiritual practice. That money is not in any way evil, that wealth is in, in no way evil, that it's fine to have ambition, to hopefully have a, uh, an ambition to... Um, do something that you love doing, that's not causing harm to anybody. And uh, and the importance of generosity. And I'll leave it there with the importance of generosity and ask you to consider uh, making a donation to Against the Stream. We're struggling to pay our uh, bills in this time of not having any rentals or any kind of donations in the center. Um, I actually had to lay off our, our one uh, employee uh, manager today because uh, we're not going to be able to afford, um, you know, and that's the reality. And, you know, again, every I give the Dharma away for free. Dharma, what I have share with you, it is yours, it's free, and it's your opportunity, if you care to, to support, um, to support us. So you can do that through making donations um, at the Against the Stream Meditation. Uh, and make sure when you're doing donations that it goes to Against the Stream Meditation Center, not just Against the Stream, because that's my old nonprofit, which is defunct now. The new nonprofit, Against the Stream Meditation. Um, and you can do that on PayPal, on Venmo. Uh, if you're not totally clear, go to the againstthestream.com website and uh, the links for donations will be there. And I'm trying to get them also up on the, um, eventually we'll have them on the um, YouTube and the Facebook and the maybe on Instagram. So please uh, be generous if you can and take care of yourself. Um, uh, I'll be okay. We'll be okay. The Dharma is uh, here and available free of charge. So um, thank you for tuning in. Thanks for your practice, your consideration. May each of us get free. And together, may we create a positive change on this planet. Um, see you next Monday. I'll also be live streaming on Wednesday morning, 9 a.m. Pacific time. And um, every Monday, every Wednesday. And then Thursdays, I'm doing a, a recovery, refuge recovery live, live stream on the Refuge Recovery um, page, Refuge Recovery on Instagram, Refuge Recovery on Facebook, um, Refuge Recovery World Services, I believe is the page on YouTube. Follow those pages. Join me if you're in recovery and you want to have some conversation and get some teachings uh, on Thursday. <laughs>